Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's coverage here in Las Vegas. I'm Sean Furrier, host of theCUBE. It's our 12th year covering reInvents. Watching the progression has been like a documentary of innovation happening over time and it's been fun to watch. And now more than ever, we're at a whole nother inflection. We've got two great guests here, you know, breaking down all the key announcements around how data's may work. Brad, BB, uh, GM of uh, Amazon Neptune and Time Stream and Evan Kaplan, Cube Owen, CEO of Influx Data. Great to see you. Thanks for coming on theCUBE. Thanks for having us. Um, so in the announcements today, Neptune's mentioned, Keen, uh, first of all, Swami did a great keynote. I love his app about finding the free food. I thought that was clever. <laughs> but you're starting how Agentic's coming together. You're starting to see how all the underpinnings are happening. Um, this has been a big part of seeing how the data is evolving. Um, give us a quick update on the news on Neptune real quick. Yeah, so if you saw Swami's announcement, what he announced was uh, bedrock support for GraphRag with Amazon Neptune. Uh, and that's super important because uh, it allows customers to get better and more accurate results and more comprehensive results for their RAG applications uh, by using a graph underneath. And for, for me, who could, I'm coming from the graph business, uh, what's really exciting about it is now customers can benefit from a graph without having to learn how to use a graph database. And so, uh, you know, we're super excited about it and yeah. it's in preview now uh, and we're going to be iterating it over it and learning from how customers use it and really when it works uh, and, and the best use cases. For the it. folks not up to speed on why the graph's so hot right now, what are the key areas why, why graph's important and how does that relate to say the, the neural network format of, of uh, Gen AI? Well, I think graph's really important because one of the things that graphs do well is they take different pieces of information and they allow you to relate them and then traverse those links and ask questions about it. And one of the, of course, the very hot topics now is how do I make my Gen AI applications mm -hmm. more reliable? How do I get them to the, where they're accurate enough to go into production? And the graphs have the potential to be able to help with that. All right, now let's get into time stream and influx, how it's connecting, where you guys, what's the relationship with you guys, Evan, tee it, tee it up. We were married. <laughs> um, no, we're about a year into this relationship, yeah. and it's um, it's a pretty great relationship. It's uh, it's unique for Amazon. I'll let Brad talk to that a little bit in the you know yeah. first open source database that they've ever done, where they actually built a relationship with the open source provider, and we have we built this really nice relationship, and um, the business is going well. And <laughs> uh, Amazon's been a great partner. Huh? Yeah, so, yeah. Tell about how that connects for you guys with with Time Stream. Yeah, so. Um, in March of this year, we launched uh, TimeStream for InfluxDB, mm -hmm. uh, which is a fully That's managed nice. version of uh, <laughs> the open source uh, InfluxDB. Uh, yeah. And uh, you know that's been very popular with our customers. Uh, and it was really important for us uh, that we do that in partnership with Influx Data, because uh, we really wanted it to be kind of a win-win uh, type of proposition. Yeah. We have some exciting things that you know we're going to be doing over the next couple of years. I think that will kind of deepen that partnership and, and make it really something that's that's a unique model. Uh, for, for collaboration. And what's been the developer um, feedback, Evan, on this and the, and the importance and the criticality of yeah. the time series? Because, you know, we've talked about this in the past on theCUBE, um, and with inference, I mean, Matt Garman basically said inference is now going to be a building block, a core building block. So that's the pinnacle of a lot of stuff under the covers. So this is going to be a lot of action for developers wow. interfacing into a lot of different data, data types, data series. What's the impact of developers that you're seeing with this? So, so even before the last couple of years of uh, the rise in AI, there's obviously been a big boom driven by IoT and time series. Mm -hmm. So time series, you know, basically sensors speak time series, time series database collect that stuff at scale, processes at scale. What's different now, and, and something Brad and I talk a lot about, is the requirement for higher and higher resolution data to build smarter and smarter models is is going through the roof. The more you know about the physical world, the more you know about the conditions, the sensor, the better, more effective models you can build. Mm -hmm. And you know, I think I don't want to put words in your mouth, but to have those workloads run on Amazon, we run we run our service on Amazon too. But but um, but Brad runs a native yeah. a native service in Amazon too. That's a that's a workload that's going to be really important to the future of AI. And how's that from a primitive standpoint as you integrate this in um, with um, Influx, as you said, you're integrating it in? So, uh, you know, customers really have loved the, the time stream for Influx DB because they can get the open source APIs that they're really used mm -hmm. to, uh, but they can get it as a fully managed AWS service. Uh, that means they can take the benefit of some of the other aspects in terms of authentication and availability and, and, and other pieces. Uh, and so that's been really popular for us. Uh, and overall, I think the partnership has caused kind of awareness of time series to grow, yeah. uh, you know, across all of our, you know, uh, all of our different uh, services. Putting time series in the hands of developers 
really is kind of the key. What's been the impact? What use cases have you guys seen expand out? Um, I've always been bullish on time series because people talk about real time all the time. Yeah. Real time data, um, you know, time series data has benefits. Well, you and I have long careers in the industry, yeah. and people have been talking about what real time, and this is sort of the, the, the manifestation of it. Yeah. The kind of database technology that's available today, the way it operates, the way it operates in the cloud at scale, um, the amount of leverage is dramatic is dramatically different. And so, you know, our big sectors are really big in aerospace, really yeah. big in energy, really big in consumer IoT, really big in industrial IoT, so Siemens, Honeywell, mm -hmm. Um, PTC, companies like that. So anybody, really anybody who's dealing with the physical world and wants yeah. increasingly better telemetry and instrumentation yeah. is going to have significant time series workloads. If you did this, you know, yeah. when, when we started my, your, our careers, yeah. mine was probably before yours, people were doing this on Oracle databases, right, yeah. and paying a lot of money for it. The difference now is the cost efficiency is so dramatic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dramatically different. Well, I'm 59, so you, you, I'm you're a maybe, young I man. Have a you're, couple a, years you're, on you're a young uh, man. Yeah, I mean, I remember I was joking earlier. I remember I was talking about how the old school we used to program our networks on SNA and DECnet and pre yep. NOSes of a proprietary, and then open source changed everything. And I think that open source revolution continues today. And I think it's become one of the best checkpoints on the industry as almost a de facto standards body because the innovation is at check because it's constantly being worked on by more people. I think you know, the commitment to open source has been great, uh, big time. So one what, what of the fascinating things, just because you bring up the historical perspective, is you, when you and I started our careers, it was there were two databases, it was Oracle and IBM DB2, and yeah. maybe you had a flat file. <laughs> the, um, but what, what, you know, first the first revolution was open source, but the second revolution, which I think has really benefited Amazon, which is basically the componentization of the yeah. data. So you have time series, you have graph, you have search, you have now, well, do you have vector? I don't know. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. We have vector. Right. the data type. Right. Right. Column uh, store. We, we have wide <laughs> column. We have yeah. in-memory caching. Um, so your ability to really componentize that data plane is so dramatically different. Yeah. yeah, and you bring up a good point. One of the things we've been focusing a lot of our editorial and research around is we've been unpacking a lot of end-user customers like Uber, for example, J.P. Morgan Chase and others. And they're, heard of those they're, companies. they're operating at such scale, but they had to build their own stuff because they were kind of first movers. And a lot of the problems that the engineers were talking about is that I had to have a time series on the column store. I had to build my own data lake. And so that kind of first generation of scar tissue, you guys are taking this to scale now. So I'm curious about the app development environment you guys will see at AWS because I can see a future where if I'm a developer, now I got in for all these tools, I can create a mosaic of an application with the databases under the covers without even doing anything. I just need time series that the models are smart enough to plug in the time series here. I got the column store for speed, look up over there. You know, I, I think you saw a picture of that vision uh, you know, with the SageMaker Lakehouse announcement where sort of you're bringing together the data lake information, your analytics, your data services, uh, your cataloging information along with the, right, the policy and controls that you need. So I think if you sort of project that forward and, and think about time series as a first class citizen and then graph and many other different, different kinds of purpose built database techniques, I think that's sort of where you know where we're looking. Yeah, I mean you can connect the dots pretty quickly. That kind of pre-agentic set setup requirements kicks in. Um, yeah. Um, um, question on the open source, real quick, if you don't mind. What's the commitment on Amazon to support the open source? You guys are work, still working together on the open yeah, so, source stuff. Comment on so the, the commitment so, to the yeah. So the details the are actually are pretty clear. So we, we delivered the open source to Amazon. They offered that as if we would offer it. They are open source okay. available to the customers and then we build in console upgrades in Amazon's in the, in the console upgrades in order to monitor stuff like read replicas, that sort of stuff. Today we do it for our 2.0 platform. Early next year we'll do it for our 3.0 platform. And so it's a, this partnership was pers was um, was rehearsed over a long mm -hmm. period of time. It's a five year partnership and, and so you know, yeah, I mean, I think about this from the long term. Yeah, that's and you guys are totally behind that. Okay, absolutely. Good. All right, so that, that's check. Check the box there. Uh, cool. Uh, real time information. You mentioned insights. That's been a buzzword. Real time insights. Um, but time series is about instrumentation. One of the big things we've talked about in the past. Um, you got run, build, test, observe. These are kind of like software principles. Observability is hot. So instrumentation is going to be probably more of a standard as you get to the edge of the network. You got self driving cars. You mentioned IoT. How much you guys see that bringing that data in? Can you scope the order of magnitude of how much data is coming in 
um, that's going to be time series like that needs to be molded into or kind of funneled into either data pipelines or whatnot? Uh, I couldn't put a number on it from a scope perspective, but I can tell oh, you that 11. we think it's a huge, yeah, it's, yeah. it's 11. <laughs> Give me a solar system. Turned up to 11. <laughs> uh, but it's a, we think it's a big opportunity, you know, because there's obviously a lot of time series data that's not captured that people can benefit from, from it. And I think, you know, to the other part of it, one of the things that we really like about Influx Data and InfluxDB is they've, they have this ecosystem of ways that's very easy to get your data to the database. And really having that, I think, is a, is a substantial value for companies. Yeah, and that helps Gen AI too. That's gonna feed, feed low latency, get the data They need data, data. Yeah. you know, you yeah. need data. So that, that, and that's a great source of it. You can you also answer that. The question, you asked Brad, you can almost answer with the intrinsics. Are we gonna, are we gonna see more, are we gonna see more sensors in the physical world? Yes. yes. Do we want those sensors to collect more data, more high resolution data? Yes. <laughs> so this data category will go through the roof yeah. and yeah. as will the price performance go through the roof. Like will, as it gets more and better and these better chipsets and better services. Yeah. Uh, like, and, and there's a whole other opportunity around synthetic data too, as you get that data in, you know, the feedback loops that are coming in to generate high quality synthetic data. We heard from Poolside today, what they're doing is pretty impressive. And so you see, I mean, this AI category is you got data, AI providers, AI consumers, and data suppliers. Um, I mean, data supply is going to be a huge deal. Your reaction to that, what do you think about that? I think, just, I think we all live in the AI ecosystem in the way we would have described ourselves living in the software ecosystem mm -hmm. four years ago. It's like yeah. everything is about how do these systems get mm -hmm. more intelligent? How do they get more autonomous, right? Mm -hmm. All systems, all human designed systems. And and my point of view and and is is, is and, and I sell time series stuff, so I'm okay, yeah. so, so take biased. it with a grain of salt. Okay, is cool. it all starts with telemetry? Yeah. yeah, all starts with telemetry. Yeah, you don't know anything about a system until you instrument it at scale. Well, I also, I mean, it's, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that it's from the edge, which is the user yep. phone or device, to the core, uh, and everything in between. That's the instrument. I mean, yeah. that's the data coming out. But we get a little, but but it's easy to get a little lost now because so much is about LLMs, which yeah. can feel like these are just about words and letters and documents and corpuses. Mm -hmm. But what's really interesting to me is the real world, like, like yeah. the instrumentation of things that are happening in the real world, not the digital world. Yeah, and I think the impact on inference is going to have a huge factor too because the fidelity of the time series is so strong. Yeah, the inference angle is going to even get more powerful. Uh, comments on that? Thoughts? Connect the dots? Share some roadmap information? No, but I, I think that, you know, absolutely the, the, supp the supply of data is going to drive a lot of it, but I think it's only part of the, the story. Yeah. I, th I think, you know, as you saw, inferencing, inferencing is going to get better, it's going to get faster, but it's really people who can think systematically and architecturally about uh, all of this data. What is it telling me? Like, how do I use it to improve my system? And that's really, I think, what's going to differentiate people who really, uh, yeah. you know, win in this kind of space versus people who don't. Great. Brad, while well, we got you here, do, do the folks a favor, explain what Neptune is so you can, we can get on the record. What's Neptune about? Obviously, a big part of the announcement and, uh, and time, time stream. So, start with Neptune first. Yeah, so Neptune is AWS's fully managed uh, graph database service. Mm -hmm. uh, it provides a, the most choice of different graph open source uh, graph APIs and graph query languages. So we support three. We support OpenCypher. We support Apache Tinkerpop Gremlin. And we support the W3C recommendations of RDF and Sparkle. Um, you know, what makes graphs great is people can use the relationships in their data to innovate. And the announcement that we had today, GraphRag, we talked about it earlier, it lets customers get more accurate results from their generative AI, RAG applications, uh, by using a graph without having to know how to use a graph database. <laughs> I love graphs, nodes and arcs. Uh, there you go. And you can, you can do a lot of things with that. Again, neural network format is just not a, it's graph all the way. They're, they're all, I mean, it, it's all graphs. Yeah. Uh, but what the, the, the fun part, <laughs> Wait, of course, is that, all... and time series. Yeah. Um, the uh, but, time stream, uh, it, it's the graph. Yeah, the, 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 you know, the, the performance is often data dependent, and that, yeah. that's part of the challenge with, with graphs. And yeah. you know, Amazon TimeStream is our managed um, time series database service. Uh, we have an, our open source engine, which is uh, InfluxDB, and we have a service called Live Analytics, which is a you know a fully serverless, yeah. multi-tenant uh, time series service. Yeah. All joking aside, Evan, though, but the time series works with graphs because what's interesting is that graph has a use case, but time series has a unique value. This is where people get caught up into the remember the old argument of. Which database do I use? No, no, they each have their own great thing. Yep. I think this is where I think you guys are onto something huge with time series because they do a really great thing for a great process of, of instrumentation. And that's huge. It's like what's going to power what I call next generation observability because telemetry is everything. Now, great things happen. 
Yeah, but it's not, you know, the, the term, and there's not, but the term's not observability. Observability is the first, that's yeah. just the first. Collecting the telemetry, it's all about, it's all about autonomy. It's all about intelligence, all about the manufacture of intelligence at scale yeah. to drive smarter, more autonomous systems. And so the telemetry is just the first part. So, so it's a really small to, piece of it. Right. Being observed system, your images, these people sitting in front of dashboards, yeah. that, that age is going to end. And what comes in behind it? What's the It pressure? becomes as you put these things in, you put all this intelligence, all this high resolution data into these smart models, and maybe you combine it with Graph and all those APIs that you yeah. mentioned, which I do <laughs> none of, right? And you put it together, and now you've got a system that's really freaking smart, that the inferences can be acted on in real time. Yep. You yep. can ingest the data at high speed, and now you've got this continuous yep. evolution. And that's how you get through the self-driving car yep. or the rocket ship. Yeah. Yeah. That goes to Mars, or maybe yeah. even the Department of well, Government Efficiency. That, le- that capture the the the, the, the spaceship. <laughs> right. No, but I think I think the smart model word has been come up many times on this event. It's yeah. happened, and I also Andy Jassy talking about practical AI. So practical AI was a nice word I heard. I love the That's a good one. love the smart model concept because they should be smart. They shouldn't be dumb. They shouldn't be hallucinating. They shouldn't lag, and they shouldn't drift. Um, but yeah, it's a good good topic. All right, what's what's next for the relationship with you guys? Next version coming. Give us a. a the next thing is I'm going to learn all of those yeah. APIs that he <laughs> just mentioned when he talks about. So, graph. Home so the next time we talk, I'm going to be able you're to say those. Do a graph database right. Now, I guarantee you. We have back a, to your room and you're going to say I'm going to learn graph database. We have a pretty hefty roadmap in front of us. So yeah. um, early next year we'll roll out read replicas for the existing system, and then we'll roll out our new 3.0 stuff built around, which, which will integrate yeah. really well with Redshift and the other Amazon services and and. Um, and take advantage of that componentized architecture. How's been your conversations here in the hallways, meetings, customers? What, what's what been the conversations for you, Evan, here at reInvent? Um, you know, it's a lot about a lot about this issue of talking to customers or talking to other vendors about the way things are developing and how fast. I think we're all ogling at how how accelerant this whole, this whole thing. And, and you really feel it when you're here at reInvent because there's so much of this ecosystem just right here. <laughs> it's, you feel it's intense, actually. Yeah. It's the twelfth year. It's always the holiday season. All the goodness comes in. You got to kind of go through yeah. the package, just unpack it. You know. I just wish it wasn't the day after yeah. Thanksgiving, the week after Thanksgiving. <laughs> I'm just gonna shift it. Time shift. You know, time series. Time stream. I time shift uh, my holidays around <laughs> reinvent. We do the same. Yeah, yeah we, we just talked about that. Yeah. Guys, I know you got a hard stop. Thank you for time coming in, Evan. Brad, great to see you. Thanks for coming on. Always <laughs> a pleasure. Unpacking all the data here in the cube. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching. <laughs>